Okay, so it's a given the uh, weather. Uh, I know quite a few probably got the emails that it's not mandatory to come, but uh, we are recording, so uh, these lectures, uh, today's lecture would be made available uh, hopefully very soon. And uh, uh, what I wanted to do was uh, um, I mean, uh, uh, so quite a few of you, uh, of you have uh, come during office hours and asked some questions, and I, I realized that there are a few things that uh, uh, need to be emphasized, and I'll, I'll do those. Uh, uh, you know, I, I try to discuss it, uh, discuss the topics that are related to uh, is the lattice and the basis of a crystal, and uh, how you get to the band structure from this tight binding picture. You know, today that's the goal. Uh, we're going to talk about. We'll, uh, we'll, what we'll do is uh, um, <coughs> look at the general method of uh, uh, getting the band structure, uh, and then uh, and then uh, talk about a specific case, which will be somewhat similar to the ones you are solving in your assignment, but not exactly. And that will give you a flavor of what uh, uh, maybe a more physical or intu intuitive feel for what the tight binding model actually does. Okay. So uh, what we had done in the last class was uh, a, a kind of an, uh, uh, we started from a single uh, uh, molecule picture where we had two molecules and uh, said that uh, if an electron sits at mo in molecule one, let's say it has energy E naught, and if it is allowed to hop to the next molecule, uh, next atom, then it can lower its energy by a certain quantity, say minus T naught. And there, uh, with this simple picture, we can write down what should be the new energies uh, of the electron. Uh, initially, when the atoms were far apart, the energies were equal, and they were just E naught, right? There were two, two electron states. But when you bring them cl closer together, uh, uh, f what we found was uh, it splits into two, and the separation goes as uh, uh, two times T naught. And uh, so e essentially you have an energy which is uh, minus E0 minus T naught and E0 plus T naught. Right? That's a very simple picture of what the electron can do. Uh, now, because there were two electrons, uh, uh, if they were far apart, uh, the total energy was two times E naught, right? Uh, it, it could be up spin too, it doesn't have to be down spin. But now, uh, once you put them together, the total energy goes down by two times T naught, as you can see here, right? Two times this. So therefore, the molecule is more stable uh, than the uh, separate atoms, uh, atom separate. So that's why, you know, they naturally want to form a hydrogen molecule or a nitrogen molecule. Then we extended this picture and said that instead of being in a molecule, I want to put those atoms in a linear lattice or a periodic crystal. Right? And, and we, we kind of, again, assume that it's a particle in a ring, right? Or it's a 1D ring, so it closes on itself. So that's a periodic boundary condition. But now, uh, uh, instead of, uh, uh, so, so from here, uh, this is what we did in the, uh, towards the very end of the last class and said that, well, I have these, uh, again, on-site energies, which are E naught. So the electron is sitting at this point in the lattice, its energy is E naught, but if it is able to hop from this site, which is say state n to state n plus one or state n minus one, if it's able to hop, it can lower its energy again by minus T naught. Right? So that's the hopping energy, right? And uh, in a periodic crystal, the, the wave function of the electron is given by the block uh, wave function and the block wave function we wrote as the following uh, uh, that you know I, I could imagine n being the wave function of an electron sitting just here. For example, if I had an s orbital electron, then uh, its wave function would be that of the you know so I, I can take state n and project it on x, and that's my wave function, psi n of x. I'm saying that's like an s orbital. Maybe it's symmetric around x. So here's a plot of psi n of x, for example, as an example. Uh, and uh, briefly today, we're going to see, we're going to take it to s orbital, p orbital, and you know mixtures of sp and all that right away from here. But that's the idea that I, if I can write uh, uh, the total wave function of the electron, as you know, Bloch theorem says that you know there'll be a weak 
uh, you know, a, a plane wave sort of feature, and then it will modulate these functions, right? That's, that, that's, that's what block theorem says. And so we take the, uh, this wave function, we write the most general wave function of the electron now in this periodic uh, tight binding model is this, you know, uh, t t times, so I'm going to sum over all uh, individual orbitals, but then I'm going to write a phase factor, which is e to the power i k dot r, or k times, let's call it x n here, over square root of n, where big N is the number of atoms in this crystal. So if the lattice constant is A, and the total length of this ring, perhaps, is L, then L is big N times A, right? And that, that, that many atoms, or that many lattice sites, right? And you can see this is basically a normalization constant, if you effectively, right? It's, it's a number here. And so when I take this sort of a waveform and say that, well, now I want to solve my you know, Hamiltonian problem, and uh, I, I don't want to rewrite it all over again, uh, but what, what you do is uh, take h psi is equal to e psi again, as, as, as usual. And, uh, and then what we assume now is, uh, so and, and I can substitute it here, you know, substitute it here. Let me do that, actually, since we're at it. Uh, Hamiltonian okay. And and uh, this Hamiltonian is a periodic potential. So so uh, you know periodic potential that uh, you know the, the 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 electron may be seeing because of uh, uh, because of the periodic crystal itself right so let me just uh, right so it's it's the right, that periodic potential right and uh, and and now uh, what I can do is uh, to, to be able to solve this problem uh, we, we take a projection on some state M uh, you know M uh, um, being, uh, you know, again, any, any of these site numbers. So n can be uh, the site number, but m could be this one or this one or the same as n or this n plus 1, n plus 2, and so on. And we just project it on a general m on both sides, right? And on the right side, you can see it's uh, because these are, you know, orthogonal states, uh, uh, the, you know, only one survives, right, on the right side. Do you see that you know these are orthogonal m and n? So only when m is equal to n, that that's the only term that's left on the right side, and and so we get e, and then e to the power i k x of n. X of n is basically this point, the nth site, the you know x-axis uh, location of that side, over square root of n. That's all that's left on the le on the right side. But on the left side, uh, you know, the Hamiltonian can go in here and act on these states. Uh, so essentially, what I'm trying to say now is this function, you know, this, uh, um, all these things do not, you know, interfere with either power i, k, x, n, and all that. They just kind of move over to this side. And what you end up here is Okay, so so that's that's what we end up with, and uh, uh, so so this is really the uh, um, I mean, uh, and and we can get uh, get rid of our normalization coefficients. They are the same on both sides, and uh, okay. So in fact, uh, I, I I I think I, I shouldn't I shouldn't write it n here. You see, you know, this should be m, right? That's the that's the term we have taken a projection on, right? And then what I do is I, is I bring it to this side, e to the power kxm, and then, and then I, I get actually my energy eigenvalues are, this is kind of the most simplified form. There are a couple of things that I'm uh, not, uh, I'm neglecting here, uh, like, uh, you know, next nearest neighbor, just a plane wave function overlap and such things. I'm just neglecting them at this point, okay? Thanks. Okay, so this is kind of a very interesting uh, uh, way. So, so you got your, all the allowed energies will look like this. You know? So there'll be some matrix elements, 
H M N between two sides M and N. Two sides, perhaps these two, or the side by with itself, or the next nearest neighbor, and next nearest neighbor, and so on. So you're gonna <coughs> cycle through them. And, uh, uh, and and this matrix element will be multiplied by e to the power i k times this distance between the two sides that you have. So physically, the matrix element between two sides times a phase factor that multiplies, you know, the uh, phase factor that has the distance between the two sides, m and n. And now this whole thing is actually a function of k. Right, this whole thing is function of k, which came from your block theorem. This is the kind of the plane wave, uh, in the wave vector of the <coughs> electron. Does that make sense? This k is 2 pi by the you know, wavelength of this thing here. So that's the expression for your band structure, the kind of the very general case. This is the band structure. As you change the k, the energy will change with k, and this is the band structure. This is kind of the result of tight binding, the simplest model. This is, uh, uh, you know, uh, but, but physically this is exactly what it is. So uh, from here you can kind of uh, uh, go, go in and, and write down the band structure without even kind of, okay, so for example, how would I write the band structure for you know, this sort of a picture, s orbitals, and I said on-site energy is E naught, hopping energy is minus T naught, right? Now, if uh, the electron is, can only hop sufficiently strongly to the first nearest neighbor, then N, so electron can lower is from N to N plus one, so that matrix element, let me write that down. First of all, if Xn and M are equal, what is my matrix element on the right side? I'm going to write the band structure now. Okay by expanding on this. So let's say n is, n is equal to m. So that's an on-site energy, right? What is the energy for that? What is the matrix element for that? n, h, n. Right? So that's just the E naught, the on-site energy, right? The, the energy uh, to sit on that side. So, so, as if there was no other atom nearby. You know, I mean, this is a free <coughs> sort of thing. So, okay. so E naught for n is equal to m. Right? Then I'm going to add. Let's look at n is equal to, or, or, or let's write it as m is equal to n. Then the next side, m is equal to n plus 1, n, n plus 1, n minus 1. So your m is an index that's running over these points now, right? And we wrote down first, what's the value for this? We wrote that down, right? And that's just E naught, right? Now for n plus 1, what do I get? E to the power what? C, uh, X. You can tell me which one you get. Yeah, IKA. yeah, I K uh, for n plus one, right? Because uh, X n minus X m. Uh, let's see. When m is equal to here, then then it's either minus I K, right? And it actually doesn't matter which one you choose, minus and plus here. But you get. You see, this term will just give you to the minus I K, and the matrix element there is T naught, right? In fact, minus T naught, it lowers its energy by T naught, so I write it as minus T naught times e to the power minus IK, right? So when, and then that, that, that is when m is equal to n plus one here. And finally, for this point, when m is equal to n minus one, so I again get lowering of T naught, and then my phase factor is now e to the power i plus IKA because, you know, xn is greater than n minus one, right? So and the distance is always just a, that, that is constant. Right? Uh, does that make sense? I mean, so. if, if, if it's not clear, I can just pause for a bit. But you know, if you can write this, in fact, uh, the beauty of the tight binding model is without going into too much effort, I can write down an expression that will write down the band structure of the whole crystal. You know? uh, generally, it's very quick. And you can look at the problem and say, how many nearest neighbors do I have to an atom? And I find my lattice sites, lattice points. Here, it's only one atom per lattice point. And then I say it can hop to a nearest neighbor, nearest neighbor. If you want, you can also include the next nearest neighbor, no problem. You can make it better and better, the model. For example, let's say it hops with a prob uh, if it hops from this side to n plus 2, that's the next nearest neighbor. It can lower its energy by, say, instead of t0, it's t1. Maybe it's smaller, right? Does that make sense? I mean, this may be, it may be lowering it by 0.1 EV here. Maybe now it's 0.01 EV, you know, the next term, if it hops there, right? 
So then, then you add another term here uh, for the next nearest neighbors. Uh, in fact, this will already give you that, right? Uh, this, this term will already give you the next nearest neighbor, and you'll get t1 times e to the power <coughs> what? If, if it goes to the next nearest neighbor. E to the two, two That's right, minus 2 ika, then minus t1 e to the power plus 2 ika, right? Does that make sense? And then you go third, fourth, whatever you want, right? So, so if you, you can take that into account. But I'm going to not, not get into the next nearest neighbors uh, uh, and, and so on. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, just le cut it off at the first nearest neighbor at this point. Okay. So is that clear? I mean, this is how we are getting the band structure. Yeah. Um, why do, are we only getting minus t naught for the energy if we said that it, the energy, when it splits because of the degeneracy, we can get a plus t naught and a minus t naught from the original? When we originally drew up the yeah, 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 yeah. So actually, uh, let me say the physical reason why uh, it, it actually uh, is able to. Uh, uh, so so uh, if I had just uh, he, he, here's actually the the answer would be like here. So the Hamiltonian of a free electron, if, if the electron was of a single atom, if the electron was tied to only a single atom, is like that, right? Yeah. But if I bring another one next bar next to it, what you can see is it always pulls down. You know. Okay. The potential is always lowered, effectively. Uh, you know, so it's always negative. I mean, the to net. Uh, now, what, what what it means is the total Hamiltonian term, because these uh, you know we, uh, these terms T's are just the matrix elements, compared to its you know original unperturbed state, it's negative. That that's the meaning of it. It gets lowered. Now the eigenvalues, of course, can go lower. Some of them can be lower than this, because some of them can be higher. You know, so that that's not what we're talking about. And then indeed, when I write this out now, when I write this expression out, you can see that uh, uh, I get E0 minus 2 T0 cosine Ka, right? right? And and half of them are above E0 uh, and half of them are below, right? So, so in the, uh, but, 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 but the, picture, the idea is, is uh, the, the reason, first of all, it lowers its uh, energies is because uh, uh, we, uh, you know, the Hamiltonian, um, uh, term uh, it, it does change in a negative way because of the overlap of the now uh, now this is uh, the second kind of very important thing uh, once we have a formula that's great but we also want to know uh, uh, what it physically uh, has done right so again if the atoms were very far apart uh, uh, and and they were not interacting let's say their energy was e naught you know this is kind of the center energy right. Uh, but now that we have built a crystal and we have this tight binding band structure, we can see how it looks. So E at k is equal to 0, cosine is 1. So I get E 0 minus 2 T naught. So you know, uh, somewhere here. This is E 0 minus 2 <coughs> times T naught. Right? Uh, uh, when k is equal to 0. When k is equal to, what is the billion zone edge? What, what's the value of k at the billion zone edge? For a lattice constant of a, yeah, uh, pi over a, right? So the reciprocal lattice vector is two pi by a, but the billion zone edge is pi over a, and then you have minus pi over a, right? Right. So, so at pi over a, what is the value of this? So cosine of pi is minus one, right? So you become e zero plus two t naught, right? So. Uh, so you go E0 plus 2 T0. This is E0 plus 2 times T0. Make sense? Okay. So at this point, here's the eigenvalue. At 0, this is the eigenvalue. And again, you know, its eigenvalue is here. Its energy is actually periodic in K. That's a very interesting consequence of block theorem. The wave function squared is periodic in real space. Uh, uh, and the energy becomes actually periodic in K. And if I were to plot this, you can, you can see the band structure will look, you know, something like that, right? This is just a cosine function. But uh, what, what has really happened is uh, when they were far apart, all the electrons states were at this. They were big N states at E naught, right? And now once you put in the crystal, it has spread out, and now you have this whole band. Of states, they form the whole band. Now this is the tight binding band that you formed because of the overlap, nearest neighbor overlaps. Does that make sense? Okay. So there were big n states, 
And no matter what we do, form a crystal, I cannot destroy the number of states. There are still big end states here, right? But they're now separated by what? 2 pi by L, right? <coughs> right? They're separated by that much. Uh, and, and it's just that, you know, just like in, an, in a single atom, uh, sorry, in a single molecule, you had only two states, and you broke up into plus and minus. Still two, right? But here you had big N states. But when the atoms are far apart, now you have still broken up into big N states, but now you have formed a band, right? And, 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 and this is the k, uh, you know, k vector is some integer times 2 pi by L, right? Right? Does it make sense? So it's essentially, uh, one way to look at it is you had these states, and now it has expanded out because of tight binding into this band, right? And you have the exact expression for the band. What is the width of the band in energy? Band width, meaning what is this, right? That's, yeah, 2 times, uh, t naught times 2 because it's going negative positive, so that, that's just 4 times t naught, right? Right, that's, that's, that's the energy bandwidth. Uh, below it, still there's a gap, above it there's gap, there, those energies are not allowed, but these energies are allowed now, right? So, so the, it has spread out. Uh, and now you can see physically, the, uh, uh, so that's the bandwidth. If I go to the very bottom of this, uh, you know, this curve. Uh, again, the bottom of the curve is is also a, always a parabola. Bottom of every you know minimum of any every curve is a is a is a parabola, right? And uh, what I wanted to uh, say is is uh, I can calculate now the effective mass of this band at this point, right? The tight binding model gives you an effective mass at this point. Uh, what? How will I find that? Right? How will I find the effective mass here? At the bottom of the you know, let's say I'd filled up electrons now. I haven't even talked about what. So I, I start filling up electrons, and let's say I've filled up a few electrons here, and I want to find what is the effective mass at the bottom near k is equal to zero. How would I find that? Yeah, good. So, right. So, so effective mass uh, is, is essentially the curvature. So we write that, you know, 1 over m star is. Uh, 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 d2e by dk squared, right? Or double derivative of the curvature, right? So, so that's the effective mass. And, uh, and you can, you know, plug this in and, you know, cosine will, you know, when you take two derivatives, you'll get, uh, you can derive it exactly. I mean, I don't want to kind of, you, you're just going to get, you know, uh, when you take two derivatives with k, you get two a's pop out, right? You get, uh, you know, two times t naught a squared. Right, and you get an effective mass in a full formula. You get a full formula for it. It will be one over cosine and all that. But you can see uh, what I'll do now is when k is very small, I can make some approximations here, and you will get the same answer that I'm trying to say. So when I when k is very small, uh, what is cosine of k? When cosine argument is very small, you can tell me the Taylor series for cosine functions. Uh, one. Uh, but that's that I want the second term really. Yeah, one minus. So, yeah, one minus uh, argument squared by two, or two factorial, which is two. So that's k squared a squared by two. Right? And then you have higher order terms. I don't want to bother bother about them at this point, right? So uh, so when k is equal to very when k is small, uh, this is very important. I write k a is much less than one. You know that's that's when. Uh, so I'm looking at very close to the minimum here, basically. Right? And, and, and then, uh, 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 then you can take a du double derivative, because that's your energy dispersion now becomes E of k is E naught minus 2 T naught 1 minus k squared A squared over 2. Right? I, I, I'm doing this exercise because it's uh, actually yeah, kind of important uh, to, to see what, what we get here. And you see immediately I get my base, which is E0 minus 2T0, which is the minimum, right? E0 minus 2T0 is here. So we are expanding around this point, right? Plus T0 K squared A squared, right? Uh, is that here? Yeah, so the, just, yeah. And, 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 and so you can right away see that I can label this as my maybe conduction band edge if you might. So this is my conduction band edge, or you know, band edge of that point, plus 
I can write this quantity as h square, you know, k square by twice the effective mass at that point, right? Right? And uh, you can read off from here that this quantity must be equal to that quantity, right? Directly. And therefore, from here, you see that the effective mass, or let's write that down, h square by twice effective mass is approximately equal to t naught a squared, or in other words, effective mass is h square by 2 t naught a squared, right? So, so if you're hopping, first of all, I mean, if your lattice constant is, 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 is small, if the lattice constant is small, uh, then the effective mass is large. See that, right? If lattice constant is, is small, then the effective, if this goes down, that goes up, right? And this is a very characteristic property of semiconductors. As you go up in the periodic table, let's look at group four elements. You have carbon, which is diamond. You have silicon, germanium, <coughs> uh, tin, and all that. This is the periodic table. As you go up in the periodic table, uh, you have germanium, uh, silicon, you know, carbon, or, or diamond. The lattice constant gets smaller and smaller. And the band gap starts increasing as you go up. Diamond has the largest band gap, and then silicon, then germanium, and lower tin is actually almost metallic, zero gap, or semi-metal. And the lattice constant goes down as you go up in the periodic table. And therefore, the band gap goes up, and the effective mass also goes up. You know effective mass of electrons increases as you go up in the period table. So for germanium, for example, uh, it would be sub 0.1, electron effective mass, silicon is about 0.2, Carb, you know, diamond, it's probably 0.4 or something like that, you know, of that order, so, so it goes up. The second thing is, is, is that uh, hopping term, and physically you can see, see uh, well, okay, so that, that's, that's, uh, that you can see right away from that expression. Also from this EK diagram, you can see why it will go up. Because as lattice constant goes down, your billions on edge gets st stretched out, right? It's going out in case space. And therefore, this whole curve is kind of getting stretched out. It's, it's, it's doing that. If I go even farther out, it does, I mean, I'm exaggerating now, but you know, it does something like that as I stretch out A, right? And therefore, the curvature is decreasing. You see that? It's not as curved anymore. It's stretching it out here, right? It looks more like a straight line as you stretch it out. Therefore, the effective mass is exactly kind of related to that curvature. The more is it curved, the smaller is the effective mass, right? So, so you can see that too. In a very same way, the hopping term, if the electron can hop very easily from one side to another, then T naught is large. It can lower its energy more, right? If it's large, then it gets stretched out this way, right? The bandwidth increases, and then you can see the curve, it will curve more as you increase the hopping term. Do you see that? Right? So the effective mass will go down if your, bat, if your hopping term goes up. And physically, you can see that it, it makes sense because if an electron can hop very easily, it can move very easily, its mass should be, it should be feeling lighter. I mean, that's physically and mathematically, it's exactly saying the same thing. So, so, yeah. so both hopping term and lattice constant uh, are related in this way. Uh, and uh, okay, so, uh, uh, and there are quite a few more things one can do from here. Uh, you can see that the effective mass is changing. You know, it's periodic also. Effective mass b is that here. Uh, maybe I can ask you, what is the effective mass at this point, at the billion zone edge? Remember, this curve is a cosine curve, right? So, yeah, basically it's negative of that, right? So the effective mass at this point is minus h square by 2 t naught a squared. Right? And at this point, it's plus of that. It's curved up. Yeah. So what does it mean to have a negative effective mass? Right. So, so negative effective mass is, uh, uh, if you remember, uh, so OK, so if I now approach this point, right, it's curving down, right? and. Let's say I had an electric field, and uh, uh, I, I start out with zero velocity, and, the, uh, and, and I have an electron here, and it starts accelerating. So its velocity starts zero, increases, 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 right? But then it reaches a certain max value, and then it starts decreasing, even though the force is pointing that way, it's decelerating. So the curvature, or the electron energies, are bunched up in a certain way that 
the electron is behaving as if it has a positive charge. Now it's decelerating in the direction it, in which it should be accelerating. Right? That's the meaning of it, really. I mean, this, that's, there's uh, uh, um, the uh, group velocity, or the velocity of the electron is always 1 over h bar d by dk. Uh, and if you know the energy versus k, you can always find the velocity, and you don't have to worry about the effective mass. But if you want to see physically what does it mean to have a negative effective mass, that's what it really means, that you know, in, instead of it has a negative charge, electron always has a negative charge, but instead of accelerating in a direction in which it feels the force is decelerating in that direction. So you can either say it has a negative mass, or you can say it's acting like a whole, a positive charge. And both of them are actually correct. Right? So if you think of it as a positive mass, you say it's a whole, it has a positive charge, then you'll get the same direction of motion again. Right? So that's the physical meaning of it, really. OK. Uh, and uh, and, and, and uh, uh, what I want to kind of add to this picture now is uh, that this model is extremely general. Um, so uh, we recover the effective mass uh, from here directly. Uh, but this model, what I talked about, is just for one sort of orbital, meaning we are assuming that there is only one sort of atom uh, electronic state that's chemically bonding to the next site, you know, so, so it's maybe s orbital or whatever be the orbital. But you can have more, you know, in each site you can have more than one electron, uh, electronic state, and they participate in the bonding. And here's an example. Let's say instead of, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll draw this. Again, this is a lattice, 1D lattice. And I'm going to sketch it as an S orbital. So here is an S orbital, you know, kind of spherically symmetric or isotropic around that point, uh, around that lattice point. Okay? And, and, and when we, uh, bring the uh, atoms together, the s orbitals overlap like that. Right? Uh, and, and because of this overlap, you get this lowering energy of minus t naught and all that. So that's the s orbital overlap uh, hopping energy. If electron hops from s orbital on site n to s orbital in site n plus 1, it lowers its energy by minus t naught. Let's, uh, let's, let's be a little more specific now, OK? So, uh, let's look at the individual atom sites again, and on-site energy was E sub s. I'm going to call it E sub s. Instead of E0, I'm going to say, well, if it's an s orbital, its energy before it formed chemical bond, before it formed a lattice, is E sub s. And, uh, and then uh, um, I'm going to now kind of say that, well, that's maybe, maybe the, uh, there are two electrons per site, and not just one. And there's also an, a p orbital here, let's say. Okay. So the p orbital maybe looks like that. This particular p orbital, maybe it looks like that. Okay. And that has an energy, I don't know, maybe e sub p. Right? right? It, it, it starts out as an energy, uh, individual energy e sub p. And, and similarly here, p orbital. I'm just sketching it like this now, but uh, you know you can have p orbital this way, that way. You can you know p, p has p orbital is anisotropic, so it can uh, have various angles and, and so on. But uh, ho hopefully it's it's kind of clear what what I'm drawing here that each site has an s orbital energy and an on site p orbital energy now instead of just one e naught. I have two now. If I had one s and three p orbitals, I will have four on site energies. Right? SP3, you know, that's the SP3 bonding of diamond and silicon and all that, right? Uh, so I'll start, but now let's just start out with two orbitals per site. And now uh, the S orbitals can overlap with each other, right? And that energy of overlap between two S orbitals, uh, uh, so, so uh, uh, meaning, I mean, I'm kind of writing it this way, S orbital with the Hamiltonian and S orbital again. That uh, uh, is, is uh, we're going to label as minus V S S, you know, S orbital with S orbital overlap. And there's a, uh, uh, this, this sort of uh, energy, we'll label it with the, this term sigma. Okay? It's called a sigma bonding. Yeah. Uh, the kind of thing comes from, remember, uh, the lower state energy is, is, is uh, a symmetric state. Higher state energy is an asymmetric state, right? It has a node in between the wave functions. So these are typically called the sigma bonds, and these are called the pi bonds. Right? 
the lower energy state is called a sigma bond, the higher energy state is called a pi bond, typically in you know, quantum chemistry. Here, I mean, this is just the notation we're going to use, S, S, sigma. For S orbital, it doesn't matter whether you call sigma or pi, but for the P orbital, actually, does, it, it makes a little bit of a difference, so I'm going to explain what, what, what I mean now. So th does that make sense? I mean, whatever we had been calling minus T naught earlier, we're now just calling it minus V S S sigma. Right? But now we're distinguishing between S orbitals, and now I'll write for the P orbitals, because, yeah, so that's the hopping term for the S orbital. Now, if the p orbital overlaps with that one, right, you can see that, uh, you know, again, essentially it can overlap, for example, this way. So the, if there are two p orbitals near each other and they overlap in this fashion, okay, that, that is called uh, uh, pi, so p, p, pi. That's called a pi uh, overlap between uh, two p orbitals. So they are, you know, for example, uh, remember p orbitals can have x, y, and z components. So let's say this is the z and y. So uh, the p orbit, uh, so what, what am I sketching here? These are basically the mod, uh, the, the, the mod psi squared, the wave function squared of the p orbital in three dimensions. So, so the probability of, if the electron was in a p orbital, the probability of finding it right here is very low, zero. It's kind of high around here and then high around here. So the electron kind of lives a little bit away on, on these dumbbells rather than being in the center. And that's the p orbital. S orbital, the probability is very high of finding it at the center, and it decays as one over exponentially as you go away from the center. So that's s orbital. Uh, does that make sense? I'm mean, just trying to. Uh, uh, if you uh, okay, so so uh, and if the p orbitals are oriented along the z direction on two lattice sites and they overlap like that. This is the energy we are going to say uh, is, is uh, uh, the hopping energy, is VPP sigma uh, pi. That's the notation we are using, uh, nothing more than that at this point. And if, on the other hand, uh, P orbital, let's say, is aligned, this is a PY orbital, let's say, that is aligned along the Y direction, and now they can overlap in, in this way too, you know, N to N. Right? They can also overlap in this way. And this would be, this sort of an overlap would be called a VPP uh, a sigma orbital. Okay. Uh, so sigma here is, is kind of, you know, end-to-end -end overlap, uh, and uh, pi is, uh, uh, you know, we can see physically it's different, right? It physically is different. And uh, what I wanted to uh, bring up here is, 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 is a more, uh, um, yeah, more accurate picture of drawn for these structures uh, here. So, so S orbital mod psi squared in three dimensions looks like that. And here are the three, three P orbitals along Z, X, and Y. Uh, so these are mod psi squares of these uh, 3D wave functions of electrons. And now here are the possible overlaps now, right? So as I mentioned, so S, S overlap, one side, next side is S, S sigma. P and P, if they are overlapping end to end, you have V, P, P, sigma. Okay. Now, uh, and I, what I haven't said is S and P can also overlap, of course, right? I mean, S in site one can overlap with P in site two. No problem. I mean, there, there, there's some overlap of these, right? So that's S and P. And uh, <coughs> It can overlap like that, or it can overlap this way. Right? Does this make sense? Okay. Now, the p orbital has a very interesting uh, uh, property that one lobe of it, wave function, on the top half is negative, and this is positive, and this is negative. It's, it's anti-symmetric around the origin. You know, just like your upper state here. It's, it's, there's a node at the origin, at the center. It, the p orbital has that property. Uh, and therefore, also here, you have positive, negative, and so on, right? So uh, now, if s here overlaps with p here in this fashion, okay, where the p is perpendicular, uh, rather, you know, the axis of p is perpendicular to the distance, uh, to the axis of the bonding. Uh, uh, so so uh, in, in, in that case, if I take the Hamiltonian, 
and find the matrix element of this situation, what will I get? Right? You will get a zero right away because, see, the, the, the Hamiltonian, uh, well, this P and S, this overlap, whatever positive terms you accumulate here, you get the negative here, right? Because you are, what you are doing here is psi of the P and Hamiltonian sits in between psi of S and you're integrating over all space. And because of this asymmetry or anti-symmetry here, you get a zero. Does it make sense? I mean, this is kind of an important point. So, so there are some matrix elements which naturally would be zero. You know? so, so whenever we write those matrix elements of a tight binding model, we just throw them out because you know that they're by symmetry, they're zero, right? So we throw them out. So, for, so as an example here, then uh, this would be called a VSP pi bond, right? Uh, I, I don't know whether I want to call it pi. I, I don't want to give it a name because it's actually zero, right? So, yeah. uh, but this one will not be zero. You can see that, right? This one, uh, you know, only one orbital overlaps with the other. Right? So this, is, this is not zero. So this is SP, uh, and uh, and it's overlapping in a sigma fashion. So we write it as VSP sigma, and. <coughs> Uh, uh, right, so, so uh, SP sigma bond uh, is, is and, and based on whether, you know, uh, this orbital side is positive or negative, you can have either a positive sign or negative sign. And we'll see that when we encounter when we choose positive and when negative. Right? Okay. Does that make sense? I mean, so you can have positive or negative depending upon. So or in other words, let's say I have another S orbital here. If this overlap term is positive, then this must be negative. That, that's what we really mean. The next slide, it must be negative, right? So, yeah. yeah. Um, so the pi bonds just mean you have two bonding sites, whereas the sigma bonds mean you just have one bonding site, or is that just a pattern? Oh, uh, say that again? Yeah. So currently, for all the cases where we have a sigma bond, it's just one area where, there, where you have overlap between the two orbitals. Uh -huh. And you, for pi bonds, it's you have two places where there's overlap between the orbitals. Is that a general? Oh, I see. So um, you can you can think of it that way. Again, the sigma and pi is are just notations, you know. Right. Uh, but uh, when we uh, are saying uh, a bond, I mean clearly the example I gave you was was such a situation when there are two regions where it overlaps, right? So that's clearly one of those situations. Where, and this we are calling as pi at this point. So, but that's just a notation, you know. Yeah, don't buy too much into that. Uh, but if you see something like this, you know that they are. Um, so the pi bond that we will deal with in this course is always like this. You know? so it's basically the, uh, and, and this will be our, our sigma bond, and, and this is pi bond. It's surprising we have to talk about pi so much today. You know? So this, is, this is, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm saying don't don't buy in too much into that. You know? so, yeah. Um, okay. So uh, now now the moment I actually go go in and try to apply this to a real problem, uh, here's how how it will turn up. Uh, let me uh, show show just an example. Uh, now I have two, uh, you know, energy states to start with, and in each side I have s orbitals and I have p orbitals, and I have two kinds of hopping elements that I'm going to, actually, uh, yeah. So I have the, these hopping elements. I have the v s s sigma is one sort of hopping element. It can hop from s orbital here to s orbital there, right? N to n plus one. It can go from s to p through a sigma one, right? No, is that correct? S to P in this picture, do I, is that allowed? No, in this picture it's not even allowed, so it's not allowed, right? But in this picture, uh, what, what are the other things allowed? What about V, P, P, Pi, is that allowed? Yes, that's allowed. So I have these two terms of a hopping now. Does that make sense? Because I have a P orbital here, which is oriented in this direction. There's another P orbital here, and it can only hop this way. There's no P, P, Sigma, because they're not oriented, the P orbitals are not oriented in this direction. There's no sp sigma because that's, by definition, it's zero again because of anti-symmetry, right? So. Now, for whatever reason, let's say you have a crystal in which this bond was not like this, but it was just slightly bent like that. It's very possible. 
if you look at cube rates, high TC superconductors, they have or some orientation. The p, p orbital kind of gets you know canted in a certain direction, and then you can see this will become non-zero now, right? And so, uh, depending on the orientation of that chemical bond or the p orbital, it will become non-zero. But let's not worry about that at this point. Okay? So uh, now, what I want to do is uh, it's kind of set up in a very nice way for this particular problem. It's an example. Uh, so I don't, don't have to worry about this. And uh, my Hamiltonian now, uh, I can write down and I'll get, a, again, you know, an EK diagram based on this picture. And uh, maybe uh, before I get the EK diagram, I want to kind of physically ask you, or into, uh, maybe we can say some things intuitively rather than trying to draw the whole diagram. So, you see, these are the s orbitals. These are the p orbital energies before it started forming a chemical bond. And now you formed chemical bonds, and you formed a lattice, you know, a crystal. And because of hopping and all that, what happens to the s orbital energy? I bring in big n, big n number of atoms in the lattice. What happens to this now? So again, it spreads out, right? It will spread out. And by how much? What will be the bandwidth of that band in one dimension? Right. So basically, just like here, four times the hopping energy. Right. And the way we have set this problem up, the s orbital can only hop to the s orbital now. Right. So it will be four times what? V s s sigma. Right. That's the bandwidth of that band right away. Right. And similarly, the p orbital will also sp spread out, and the bandwidth will be what? Four times v p p pi. Okay. That, that, so that's a band. And that's a band. And I have not, you know, this is just a representative picture of, of how the bands may look. Right? Just a representative. And I can sketch out the full band structure too. Don't have to stop there. I can now say, well, how will my EK diagram look? And you can maybe help me now. Uh, because if you get this one, I think you have understood tight binding band structure. If you get the, oh, how, how, how will I plot it now? Right? My EK diagram. I can always go back and say, well, let's say I have not formed chemical bonds, then obviously this is my center energy, right? If I didn't form any lattice, all the energies are bunched up here for s orbital, all the energies are bunched up here for the p orbital, right? Make sense? If I didn't form the lattice. But now I've formed the lattice, and I have a lattice constant of A, so immediately I get a Brillouin zone pi by A to minus pi by A, right? right? And now, what, how does the band structure look? Maybe you can help me with this now. Beyond that, what can I say about the band structure? EK diagram. I'm, I'm not even, I haven't, I haven't calculated it, but I'm saying that if you calculate it, you'll get exactly what I'm trying to do now, right? So, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, this is exactly what you get, right? If you take the nearest neighbor hopping, right, you can see that here, S and P orbitals are not talking to each other. They're just going in, you know, independent of each other. So s orbital develops a band, and it goes again like this, OK? Just, I mean, it's exactly the same thing, right? And p orbital will also develop a band, but when you actually solve it, you will see very interestingly, it will flip around. It will do something like that right? when, you, when you actually do that. And, 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 uh, uh, and, and the bandwidth of p orbital is just that. Bandwidth of s orbital is just you know that, four times that. And here, here are the, the two bands. So electrons, if you start out with two orbitals, you get two bands. If you start out with four orbitals, you get four bands, and so on. Right? Number of orbitals you start out with for each side is equal to the number of bands you will form in the end. Does that make sense? And it may, you know, really, yeah, why? Because you had one electron perhaps in the p orbital, one electron possible in the s orbital, and you have two n. It, two electrons per site, and you have n sites, so you have two n electrons. I mean, essentially, the number of states remains fixed, right? And, and uh, you know, you had, you know, big N here and big N here. They just expanded out into these bands. Yeah, Joe. Mm -hmm. Remember, why does the, the P orbital band have a maximum? Um, right, so that, that, that I would suggest you, we, we have to solve that part. But uh, physically, you can actually explain it. Uh, from the fact that you know the way functions are anti-symmetric for the for the p orbital, you know. Uh, uh, okay, let me let me be clear. This is the case we will get when we solve our problem. It does not need to be. It can it can also go like that. It's possible to have that band too. 
I mean, I'm saying that for semiconductors, the way we will choose, if your p orbitals are aligned in this way, you know, all positive, 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 like that, then you will get this band. If you flip this, positive, positive, negative, if it goes around, then you'll get, again, that band. So, so it's kind of interesting. So, OK. Uh, uh, yeah, I, uh, you know, but, but I mean, this part, uh, you know, as long as we understand that it expands out into bands this way, that's what I wanted to get to. You know, tight binding will kind of do that. And not only that, if your hopping elements, let's say of the s orbital are extremely strong and p orbital is also extremely strong, you can expand out and merge the bands. You know. Does that make sense? You can actually have two bands merge, you know, overlap with each other, in which case, you can have a semi-metal or something like that. You know, there's no gap anymore, right? So, so you, you can have a gap or not, depending upon how the elements are talking to each other, what are the hopping elements and all that. Yeah. So is this the equivalent of the induction of valence band? As an example. So here, that's right. So if I were to uh, uh, have a situation where I have, you know, uh, in a 1D lattice, uh, uh, these are the bands that are formed, let's say, and the hopping elements are such that there's a gap in between the two bands. And then I come in and I fit, uh, let's say, I have a total of only n, uh, I have only of two n, n electrons, meaning I came in and uh, with each or s orbital came one electron, with each p orbital came one electron. So now I have to fill two n electrons in this band, right? And you know that each band has exactly n sites or n states in which each state can hold two. So I fill up 2n and I'm done. I'm filled up with this band. So this band is now my valence band because it's full. This is empty. And then it is the gap here. And this is your conduction band edge. This is the valence band edge. Right. Now, on the other hand, I could have a situation like this because remember, an s orbital can hold two electrons. Right? And a p orbital can also hold two electrons. So this each atomic site could have come with four electrons, not just two. Right? Or it could have come with three electrons. Maybe the s orbitals are filled and only one p is filled. Right? This is 1s2 and 2p1, maybe something like that. In which case, let's say I have three electrons per side. And then you can see that I fill up, I run out of two, ele two n electrons here, and then I fill n, and then I have a metal now. Right? Right? So in this metal, uh, I have a gap, but that's not at the Fermi level. You know, so you know, the, the gap is always there. It's not at the Fermi level. It's somewhere deep inside. And I have electrons filled all the way till here. If I had three n electrons, so that would be a metal, and so on. Right. So it depends on how many electrons I have. Now. Okay. So and just like we wrote down. Uh, now here's a quick question. Perhaps we can help answer me uh, answer. So if this was the conduction band of, uh, let's say it was a semiconductor, and here's the conduction band, what would be the effective mass at this point? Uh, yeah, it's definitely positive. It's curving up, right? But what is the value? It's exactly that, except t naught. What is t naught? It's determined by which orbitals? P orbitals. p orbitals in this way, right? Because this thin band is completely come from p orbitals. So that term that's sitting in there is just v p p pi, right? the t naught, just v p p pi, right? Uh, right, and and then we'll see later on when we look at silicon and gallium arsenide, gallium nitride, this will become very important. We'll realize that in those semiconductors, the s orbitals determine the conduction band minimum, and the valence band maximum is always determined by p orbitals. We'll see that, you know, uh, later. On. And it, it, this is evident here, at least, right? The p orbital, it's determined. And if it's a p orbital, uh, we did a 1D model. We just said kx, but actually. You, obviously, you can have a 3D crystal. And you can see that if you have a 3D crystal, the p orbital, the way it bonds, is very anisotropic. As a result, we'll see later on that the effective mass of p orbital base states, which would be, for example, valence band states of semiconductors, would be very anisotropic. You know, if a hole or valence band electron moves this way or that way, it's not quite the same. Whereas the conduction band states will be typically composed of s orbitals. And we'll see, because of that property, they're very isotropic. They, you know, don't, the mass is kind of the same whichever way they go. So we'll see that. And, and uh, similarly, you can see that both here and here, you have only the s orbital hopping element that determines the effective mass, right? So, yeah. Yeah, OK. So uh, now, uh, uh, what I wanted to point out is uh, uh, that if I have uh, the 
angles, which you do have in many crystals. If you have angles of uh, uh, bonding, uh, how, how do you deal with that, right? So if you have a s orbital here and a p orbital here, that we already saw is zero because of symmetry. But if I had a little angle here at an angle theta, it's just like a vector. What you can do here is you can take this orbital and decompose it into a perpendicular and a parallel. Right? Uh, so, so in other words, you can write that that p orbital that is at an angle <coughs> So, uh, and, and uh, it's actually a great simplification uh, that you can do that. So, so let's say I have a p orbital that looks like that, and it is at, at, at a certain angle theta. So I can write that, is that the correct angle? Yeah, okay. So I can write that p orbital state, you know, uh, as a p in this direction and a p in that direction, and so p, uh, let's call this as Z and this as X. Plus something times PX. And you can do your, you know, sine or cosine. So, you know, the wave function when we along the X direction will be a cosine theta, right? And here would be a sine theta. You can just do that. And the crystal geometry, if you have silicon, if you have tetrahedron, will determine what is the angle in 104 degree or 60 degree, whatever be it. That angle will be determined by the crystal geometry and all that. But once you have that, you can do this. And what, what are we really doing here is we are saying that, you know, instead of, uh, you know, having, uh, so we're just, just projecting x, y, and z. We are taking the projection of x, y, and z along this or these axes and the whole orbital therefore can be projected along this angle and and clearly again the reason we do that is this part is going to be zero right again by by this anti-symmetry property whereas this part will be non-zero so you only are left with v s p orbital is sigma bonding because there's n to n cosine theta right does that make sense i mean that's what you're left with here so that's your matrix element for an overlap between something like this and something like that, S with P, right? So, and it can go a little more interesting. I mean, you can have another P orbital here and you can say, how does this P overlap with that? Do exactly the same business again, right? Now, if you have a P orbital like that, you can take this and this axis and this vertical Z parts will be a pi bonded, right? With P with P and, and, and then the X axis will be sigma bonded and so on, you know, so, right? So, uh, and then this is something you're going to, uh, you, okay, so he, here's, here's uh, another example uh, of p orbital at an angle to another p orbital, in which case you get p p pi sine theta, and the cosine part is zero, by symmetry again, right? So, right, because plus minus, and this is plus minus, so anyway, so you'll always get a zero here. So, uh, uh, now, uh, and you can extend it into d orbitals, but d orbitals get a little more, you know, complicated. They are of high interest in, you know, cube rates and high TC superconductors now because they are really d orbital based. But we are not going to talk about that too much in the class today, uh, in this course. Uh, but the method is exactly the same. I mean, you just take them and look at the symmetries and combine the orbitals, linearly combine them, and out pops your tight binding. The tight binding is completely determined by this matrix, I mean, these hopping elements, PP sigma or PP pi's or SP's and all that. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, I just may want to pause and uh, I, I know I went through this fast, but is that clear or any questions? So basic idea of tight binding model is that every site I have atoms that have come in with certain uh, orbitals. S orbitals, P orbitals, and you can count you know, whatever number of orbitals you want to take into account. A good example, for example, uh, I, and you're doing two, two problems in the assignments now. You're doing graphene, right, uh, uh, and or boron nitride, and you're doing uh, silicon. Uh, so so in, in, in graphene or boron nitride, what you have is, is this sort of a hexagonal crystal. Uh, and uh, so w the chemical bonding here is carbon. Uh, carbon has S orbitals and it has three p orbitals, px, py, and pz. Okay. 
Now, uh, uh, the, uh, and then let's say this is the xy plane. So the s orbitals of carbon here and here will overlap. You get a ss sigma bond, right? The p orbitals along x and x will overlap along y and y will overlap. They'll be all in plane, right? And so this is a very interesting property of graphene or graphitic material or boron nitride that the chemical bonds that are formed here are composed of one s orbital and two p orbitals. This is a sp2 bonding, you know, sp2 bonding. And sp2 bonding is planar. It can form bonds, and all the bonds are in the same plane, same two-dimensional plane. It's a two-dimensional bond. And so that's what leads to these 2D materials, two-dimensional crystals, uh, the sp2 bonding. Uh, for at least for carbon and, and uh, you know, boron nitride, uh, graphene and boron nitride. And these sp2 bonds are chemical bonds and you can find their bands and all that, but you'll be surprised this assignment, I'm not asking you to find the bands of the sp2 bond. I'm asking you to find what happens to the one that's left out, the pz orbital, because that is what is responsible for conductivity in these materials. And that orbital is kind of sticking out here, right, like that. It's a pz orbital, it's a pz orbital, so I think this is a very easy problem, you know, because all you have to do is look at the hopping between PZ and PZ, and that clearly is a PP pi bonding. So all these materials, two-dimensional layered materials, uh, not all, but you know, at least graphene and boron nitride, uh, have this pi bonding based electronic properties. All the transport, high mobility, all that business comes from here, you know, from the overlap of the PZ orbitals. And, and, and the electron that's sitting here can delocalize by hopping there, hopping there, and it can delocalize and move around over the whole crystal. And, 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 and that's the, uh, uh, the pi bonding based energies. Okay? Now, there are obviously energies associated with this too, but I'm, you can calculate it too using the tight binding, but I'm not asking you to do it you know, in, in the assignment problem. Right? But this one, I'm asking you to do it. And how do you do it now? Uh, is it kind of an important problem? Uh, you see now, in a 2D crystal, you have to figure out what are the nearest neighbors, right? Uh, in the 1D case, it was just you know, to the right and to the left. Now you have to be a little more careful because there are more, right? I look that you know, there is one this way, there is one this way, and there is one this way. There are three. Right? So as a result, you will get essentially terms. I'm not going to solve this for you, but I can write down without ask. You know, you'll get either the part i k dot n1, where n1 is one of these vectors. Right, k dot n2 and k dot n3. There are three vectors now, right? And I'll get k dot n1 plus e to the power i k dot n2 plus e to the power i k dot n3. And then you'll have all these other energies which are, you know, p state, ground state energies and all that and minus, uh, you know, that, that, that's effectively, I'm, I'm not, not saying this is your band structure, but it will look something like this. You know, e of k as a vector will look like this. The p orbital, the pz orbital energy before it hops, and then when it hops, it can lower its energy like that by going to three sides, right? Next near side. Does that make sense? It's the same deal really as the 1D problem, but now written in a 2D form. Now k happens to be kx comma ky. It's a vector, right? And so is this, so is this, all these k's. So you get a band structure in 2D k space E of kx and ky, so you can plot it now. And when you plot this, you will see you will get a Dirac cone and all that stuff. You know, it will immediately emerge from here. And uh, uh, so essentially for the graphene, you will get a, like a cone sort of dispersion. But for boron nitride, uh, uh, you will, you will, it, 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 it won't be a cone because the site energy here and site energy here are different. So, so you will see it will be slightly different here, right? So for boron nitride, right? in which uh, for boron nitride, the band structure you will get ek diagram into space will be somewhat like this, except there'll be a gap. You know, there'll be two paraboloids you know, with a gap in between. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Question. So, for this situation that we have depicted, well, it seems like only the two positive or only two negative p orbitals are overlapping. Why are we modeling it as a VPP pi bond and another one that we haven't denoted instead of a VPP sigma bond? Mm -hmm. So, right, so again, uh, the VPP, 
uh, pi bond is the one when they are going, you know, both are in the z orientation. Yeah. Whereas VPP sigma would be when both are in the x orientation. So if I had overlaps of two sides that are like that, that is VPP sigma. Right? Okay. Whereas if the overlaps are of this sort, you know, if, if they're overlapping like that, that's VPP pi. So, uh, so in this situation, I mean, the way, way it is drawn here, you don't have, uh, 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 you know, this is kind of a hybrid where you have one along z along x, and the sum is the integral is zero, weak by symmetry. But if I have such a situation, then then I will have a VPP sigma bond, and that will be an overlap, and that's allowed. So I can have a crystal. I think some of the polyacetylene organic long chain 1D molecules are like that. They, they do have that bond you know, uh, end to end. So uh, there are a few examples that I would suggest you can look at it. So well, methane molecule uh, and showing that why is methane molecule CH4? This is not even a crystal. Why is it a tetrahedron? You know, and, and, and that you can see the carbon has one s orbital and two, you know, and p orbitals, uh, three electrons in p orbitals, and then it captures four hydrogens. And then when you solve the tight binding problem, what you get are the, all the eigenvalues that, that the electron can take, but also you get the you know, sp bonds that, that uh, can occur in this crystal, and you'll get that it, it must be tetrahedron. You can also kind of uh, <laughs> conclude that. In, our, in this course, we are not, I'm not asking you to find out the crystal structure. What we, are give, you know, we are assuming that by X-ray measurements, by TM measurements, we already know the crystal structure. We know the distance between atoms, the A, the lattice constants, and all that. We know how they are arranged. Now, find out the electron band structure, EK diagram, right? And that's what we are doing in this course. We're not trying to find out what is the stability, wh whether it's tetragonal, whether it's perovskite or diamond cubic. We're not doing that in this course, okay? Uh, and and uh, as an example, for the methane molecule, uh, for methane molecule, you get uh, the you know, hydrogen S orbital, the hydrogen bonds to carbon, and you have two S and two P of carbon that are available for bonding. So there are three, so four electrons in carbon and four from hydrogen. And so you have four bonds and two electrons in each. And they share the eight electrons, therefore. And, 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 and the total, you can kind of calculate from here what is the total lowering of energy if you form the methane molecule instead of having four hydrogens and one carbon separately. It's also uh, the LCA or the tight binding model. But this is not for a band. It's just for a molecule. Uh, but it, it takes into account this. Uh, so, and you can look through here. There are a few other examples, and then you get the 1D model, which we covered right today, and also in last class. And as long as you get a physical feel for it, it's very important to uh, understand what has happened. Uh, and, and that picture, that you start from one energy state, but then you expand out because of overlaps between nearest neighbors, right? And then you form bands, uh, and, and then you get your band structure. And the beautiful thing about the tight binding is you pretty much get an analytical sort of expression, which is nice. You can plot this out. You know what is the band width. The band width de de determined by the hopping elements. Stronger is the hopping, larger is the band width. Larger is the band width, smaller is the effective mass at the band edges, and the better the electron can move, and that sort of thing. Uh, now that's for one uh, orbital. Uh, and uh, as you can see now, uh, what we mentioned. Oh, the other thing I, I kind of wanted to say uh, is uh, the band width is 4 VSS sigma as we calculated, or 4 times the hopping energy. And if you go back and look at your free electron picture, there, the bandwidth was given by, you know, if this is the, uh, the Brillouin zone edge, you opened a gap due to perturbation theory, as we had explained earlier, at g by 2, right, which is pi by a. And the energy at that point was, you know, uh, the, the energy at this point, unperturbed energy, is just k is equal to pi by a, right? So this is a free electron band structure which gives you a bandwidth of the lowest band of this much. This is a tight binding band structure that gives you this much. So they're kind of, kind of should be reasonably equal or equal order, order of magnitude. And from there, immediately, you can find out what is an order of magnitude of my hopping element right away. You know? so here's the hopping element magnitude, a squared by m a squared. Right? And a is just the lattice constant. And you could have said it without, because there's only one thing in this problem, which is the lattice constant, which is, you know, uh, that you that you provide in a free electron problem, so so the you get an estimate of this right away from here is what I mean today. Right? Uh, 
and and uh, now and then we expand it out to uh, more uh, uh, orbitals instead of just one orbital in this example in your slides you have uh, please read through it so you have one s orbital and a p orbital in the plane along the axis in which you will get these vpp you know sigma bonds uh, vpp sigma bonds like here right you'll get those and now you get basically if you write down the equations i mentioned earlier you, you now get these two bands. Okay. And when you get the two bands, you can now kind of go back and also, uh, you know, these are the eigenvalues of this sort of a matrix. Uh, and uh, uh, if you ask what is this state composed of, you will see that is completely co composed of just S orbitals. If you ask what states are these composed of, you will see that's completely composed of P orbitals. Coefficient of P is one, coefficient of S is zero. Yeah, so you'll see that. Because when you ask for the eigenvalues, this, if this is the eigenvalue, what is the, what is the eigenfunction? These are the coefficients, C1, you know, C coefficient of S plus coefficient of P, coefficient of S is zero. There's no S orbital component left here at this point. Anywhere in between, it's a hybrid, it's a mix of two. It's an S and P are probably talking or something like that here. See, in this, in this problem, you can have a SP orbital hybrid, right? You can hop from S orbital here to the P orbital there, that's allowed. Uh, whereas the other one I was looking at where the p orbital was like that, that's not allowed. So uh, as a result, you get also the sp terms here in addition to ss and pp, you also get sps here. And this can be completely analytically calculated. Uh, and and uh, okay, so uh, uh, now uh, essentially what I want to say now is you can expand it out uh, and the same thing kind of more atoms, more bases, more complicated things, but idea is exactly the same. You know, you go find more, you know, if you have 10, 10 nearest neighbors, that would be a very complicated crystal, but then all you'll have then is instead of just two nearest neighbors or three nearest neighbors, you kind of have more, right? And, but as long as you know the symmetries of the crystal and the hopping elements, that's all there is to it. I mean, you just write down this thing and solve E versus K, right? And that's what, what is called the band structure of all, pretty much all semiconductors. Uh, and I've asked you to do that for silicon and also for uh, gallium arsenide in the course, right? in, in, in the assignment. So, and, and that's, uh, you can pretty much, uh, uh, so he, there are quite a few examples here. I'm gonna skip over them. Uh, there's also graphene, which you can read through here, you know, and, and, and before you, uh, solve your assignment problem. Uh, but I wanted to kind of get over uh, to this point, which is the most uh, conventional semiconductors, silicon, germanium, gallium arsenide, have this sort of crystal structure. Right? Each atom here, say a silicon atom, comes with, uh, um, it has obviously a lot of core levels, but the ones that form participate in chemical bonding are 1s and 3p orbitals. It's like, di like diamond, like carbon. One S uh, and three P orbitals. So each site, uh, what I mean then is uh, for, for diamond or germanium or silicon, uh, each atomic site has one S orbital, okay? And three P orbitals along Z, along X, and along Y. So there are four orbitals at each atom's atomic site. S, P, X, P, Y, and P, Z, right? So, and, and each silicon atom, let's say I've done a TEM and X-ray and all that I found out, it is, it, it is actually bonded tetrahedrally uh, to four nearest neighbors, four nearest neighbor atoms here. So four, uh, uh, orbitals in each site and um, bonding to four nearest neighbors. So, um, and then uh, the silicon crystal has, these are the basis vectors for the silicon crystal. You know, you can have one at origin and one. Uh, so, so in other words, I can have, this is a uh, one lattice point and the second lattice point is, you know, along the diagonal of the cube from here to there but at a, a over four, A is the, you know, this lattice constant is over. So somewhere one fourth of this point is here. So what does that mean? Uh, it means that I can take a basis, uh, uh, okay, so, so essentially by translating by these two uh, lattice points, I can reach all lattice points in the crystal 
and each point would kind of have four nearest neighbors. And uh, as a result of this, essentially what we really mean to say is I have a silicon atom here, and another one over there, and each of them has four nearest neighbors, and uh, therefore two times four is eight, and there will be eight equations or eight, uh, you know, eight, you'll get an eight by eight matrix from here right away. So, so that's, that's what it really means. You get an eight by eight matrix, and in fact, I've asked you to do that in the, in the assignment, right? So you're solving eight by eight matrix here. And the problem, again, is very similar to what I just said. You, you again, just like graphene, you had e to the power i k dot n1, n2, n3. Here, there are four vectors, n1, n2, n3, and n4, four nearest neighbors. And k is three-dimensional now, kx, ky, and kz. It's a 3D crystal, not a 2D crystal anymore, right? So, so that's, that, that will kind of give you your full band structure. And, and it kind of also is written out here in great detail. Uh, that the wave function looks like this. You have site you know, at, at, at one site and then the other site. Now silicon has a two atom basis. It's not a one atom basis, just like graphene, also two atom basis. So you have to consider two atoms and then their nearest neighbors. And, and therefore you end up with this sort of a, you know, eight by eight matrix. That's, that's what it's going to get at. So you get a EK. So you'll have eight unknown coefficients. For, the, for this problem you had uh, uh, you know, it's, it's really determined by the basis and the lattice. If the basis has two atoms and a four nearest neighbor, you get eight of these coefficients. And here's your matrix now. Uh, you can think of it as, uh, now this is actually done for gallium arsenide. It could exactly be for silicon too. This is if electron was hopping from a site onto itself. That's a diagonal element. That's H11. Diagonal element, that's your E0 terms, or the S orbital energy, or a P orbital energy. It stays on that same site in that same orbital. Right? This is actually done for the way it's written here is for gallium arsenide. So, again, uh, one S orbital for gallium and three P orbitals. Right? This is site A. There are two, two site bases, I mean, two atom bases here. And this site B, again, one S orbital and three P orbitals. So, you can think of this as gallium and this is arsenic. If it's silicon, both are actually silicon. But you have to consider them separately because they're two atom bases. Just like in graphene, they're two atom bases. You have to consider them separately. Uh, uh, you can't say that the uh, crystal. So what I mean to say is in graphene, you know, these points are not your lattice points. This is very important in graphene. In graphene, lattice points are different. So this is your basis, and the lattice points are every second one. That's, that's your, those are your lattice points. And the reason for that is, if I choose these two lattice point vectors, I can actually go to every other lattice point. But if I choose this and this, you'll see you'll miss quite a few. So that's not allowed. So your basis here is two atoms minimum, and these are the lattice points. Similarly, in silicon, your basis is two silicon atoms, and it has the FCC sort of uh, lattice point. So which is why you get this sort of matrix. And the matrix, you can see now, there are a lot of details. But if you look carefully, you'll know exactly where all these terms come from. G0 is here, SS sigma. So this is your S orbital column, S orbital row, S on site 1. This is S on site 2, the next nearest neighbor. So if it goes from S orbital here, site 1, to the next nearest neighbor, it's going to lower its energy by VSS sigma. right? Right? And what's the phase factor you get? You get e to the power i k dot n1. Right? But then there are four of those. Right? And they're all equivalent. So you get e to the power i k dot n1 plus n2 plus n3. Right? right? So, so that's the lowering for the, this term. You look at g1. g1 is now going from s orbital row to uh, this is a p orbital uh, uh, on the uh, next nearest site or something like that. You know, s to p. So you get a sp sigma bond. And you get G1, and G1 is now s saying that now it depends on which side. So, so if I have a s orbital here and a p orbital here and here, you can see that for this side, positive, negative, positive, negative. You will get a positive sign, but this side you will get a negative sign because the wave function is kind of the p orbitals are always ordered, meaning if they are positive, negative, positive, negative, and and so on. They are always ordered in this way. Right? So if on one side you get a 
plus V S P sigma. The other side, you'll get a minus V S P sigma. Does that make sense what I'm saying? So, so because of this ordering, and therefore you get plus, minus, mi minus, and plus, so essentially. And, and so on. So all these terms, hopefully. And, and you can see the one third and two thirds, hopefully you can guess where they're coming from. These are just basically thetas, cosine thetas and sine thetas. And you take the you know, angular projection and all that. Thing. Uh, OK, so uh, what I'll, uh, uh, so I'll kind of, I, uh, hopefully you are able to then you know, plug in these values and then just plot E versus K. K is equal to 0, and you vary your K, and you get this whole. You know, these are all just the eigenvalues of that matrix at various values of k that you have defined. Right? So it's a band structure. You get the whole thing. And then you can go back and say, well, what is this orbital composer? Because I know this is the valence band. You'll see this is like p orbitals completely. What's that orbital and all? You can find out how much weight of which orbital is in each of these states in the bands completely. You, know, you can decompose it or reduce it to what orbitals did those states come from. And, uh, uh, and so on. So this is done in your, uh, in your, also written up here, and you, can, you will see some of it in your assignment as well. Okay. So uh, uh, I also have uh, this uh, very simple example. Uh, I think now that we have gone much further than this, I don't know. So if I have a 2D lattice which is not hexagonal but a cube, cubic or a square lattice, you know, a 2D lattice which is square, very simple picture. Uh, I have s orbitals everywhere, let's say, you know, and and then I say, find the tight binding band structure for this picture, uh, you know, for this uh, s orbital with a lattice constant of some a. Now I can ask you that, well, in some, maybe I have created a crystal where it's very easy to hop this way, but it's very hard to hop that way. Right? I can actually, I do have, you know, in, in, in uh, situations I, where, where it's much easier for electrons to go that way than to that way. Right? These are anisotropic crystals. And you can kind of calculate your whole band structure. Uh, here, here, basically, I'm showing that if I have no hopping in EK diagram, if I don't have any hopping, T, T naught is zero in both directions, then you have only one energy left, right? And that's as if they're not bonded. Right? There's no band developed. Then I, I turn on the hopping, and I'm, I'm kind of plotting these at, as bands at different points in K space. This is a two-dimensional two K space. I'm taking a slice through you know, one point in the K space. Then off, off here, off here, and all that. So I'm taking it in various directions. And essentially, you form bands. But more interestingly, here's the EK diagram for a 2D, crystal, uh, 2D uh, square lattice. And I've turned on the hopping term to about 0.2 electron volts, let's say. And you can see how the bands look now. Basically, all that is, is cosine in that direction.